All right, good morning, everybody. Everybody have a good time last night? Yes? <laughs> um, so uh, before I get started, uh, I'm Louise Popic, and I'm with Centrify. And I'm going to talk about uh, managing privileged identities uh, uh, in your data center and um, how to control you know, who has access to what, when they have it, and what they can do with their privileges. But uh, before we get going, I just want to uh, know the uh, you know what the areas of interest or or you know what you do in your daily work um, How many of you work at all with Unix or Linux? Just raise your hands no. And how many of you work with uh, just the, the Windows operating system view administration or Active Directory? Okay, cool All right, and um, How many of your organizations are looking at say mobile device? Uh, strategies probably everybody okay and then, uh, or just, just a few more questions. Um, so how many of you have to comply to PCI, the, the credit card regulations? HIPAA, Sarbanes-Oxley. All right, any defense contractors in the room? No, <laughs> fine. All right, so um, that, that's good. That gives me a perspective of uh, you know, the challenges you guys face and also the areas you work in. So, um, so I, I think you know most organizations we, we find ourselves and and by the way I've been uh, you know in the security space for about 15 years I did uh, a lot of programming before that also you know always multiple platforms so I'm familiar with the mainframe Unix Linux Windows um, mobile devices and uh, just the security challenges around those um, and I've worked for you know Fortune 500 companies on how are they going to you know secure uh, their privileged users and just secure their environment in general. As well as you know, working for a vendor and interfacing with a lot of uh, large corporations and hearing about their challenges. So um, I think something that we all we all share in common is you know we all have people with privileged access, um, and we have to trust them, right? They're internal users. We have to trust them, and so um, we also need to be able to verify though what they did. But uh, when you when we trust these privileged users, we generally put in some you know security controls around the environment. Um, in a perfect world, we only give them the privileges they need as opposed to a lot of privileges just so they can get their job done. Uh, but, uh, and then, you know, we try to, to do, you know, least access and least privilege. And, you know, every year new technology comes out, it gets a little bit easier, but if you, you look back in history, at least as old as I am, you know that um, lots of times before we gave a lot of people access to a lot more than they needed, and we gave them a lot more privileges than they really needed to do their job, but, um, it just was easiest that way. So there's a lot of uh, good um, regulations out there that uh, I think you know NIST and others put out in terms of security, and and you know we've heard about those for 20, 25 years. The, the you know the military and some of the you know national security issues caused the government probably to be first on information security. And so um, I, I, my you know these are all things we've all heard of: locking down privileged accounts, enforcing sec consistent security policies. Establishing separation of duties, the people who grant access don't necessarily have access themselves. Um, so all these are good security principles, and if you want an exhaustive read of all this information, uh, you can always go to NIST and, um, and really drill down into the, the, you know, the security recommendations they make and, and you know, essentially uh, a lot of really good best practice information. Um, and you know, it all has to do with access control, the ability to audit what people have done with these privileges and ensuring that you know uh, you have individual accountability and it, that gets down to that and we'll talk more about it in a little bit but the, the use of shared accounts so if I let you use you know administrator or root or Oracle or you know the SAP basis admin um, and I let the other guy use it to you know how am I gonna hold the two of you accountable or the three of you accountable or however many have it right for their individual act, uh, actions and I'll talk more about that in a minute, you know, how to eliminate the use of shared accounts. But that gets into that, you know, audit and accountability piece and also trust but verify. How do I go back and verify what somebody I've trusted uh, with, with privileges, um, how do I verify what they've done? So a lot of people find that um, even if you don't necessarily have PCI, which I, I think there were some that did but not a lot, even if you don't have PCI to comply to, um, PCI is written more, you know, for the practitioner as opposed to maybe the student or professor uh, approach that NIST took. Um, so it's easier to read, basically. Uh, it's, and it's easier to understand um, 
you know, and communicate to others who maybe aren't security professionals what they have an impact on the security of the system because maybe they're the data owner. Um, you know, what the security regs are and why you should comply to them, what the benefits are. So we're going to, as we go through this, we're going to talk about these different PCI requirements and, and how the, the centralized solution, how we lock down privileged accounts and enforce policy on uh, operating systems and devices in, in order to um, meet these requirements. Some of these are, you know, do not use vendor supplied default for system passwords. Everyone knows that, right? And then uh, I think requirement eight, assigning a unique ID to a person with computer access, that's very important, getting away from the use of shared accounts, um, enforcing least access, uh, and then tracking and monitoring what people do. So how do I, how, how do I have the logs or the playback information of what a user's done on my system uh, to, to be able to verify their actions? So I, I'm not a, yeah, I, I'm not a big slide person. I've only got about a, a handful more of slides, and then I'm gonna go into a, just an abbreviated demo of, of. Uh, you know, the use of um, Centrify to, to enable privileged users to have just the access they need and also to control what they do and then audit it. But I, I will spend a few more time on, uh, a little bit more time on slides. But I, I just don't want anybody to sit there and think she's going to kill us with PowerPoint. So, um, so this talks more about some of the recent challenges. You know, previously I've talked about, you know, the regs and, and NIST and, and things we've known from a historical perspective about security. This really talks about more of some of like the recent challenges in terms of cloud-based computing and mobile, and the fact that you know our, our network is everywhere we go now. Wherever this device is, we could have access to the network uh, uh, of you know our organization. Also, people can. Um, it used to be, you know, you, you got a laptop. It was kind of a slow process when you joined a company. You got a laptop. They knew who had it, and you joined the network and. And it was a slow process, of, you know, a on, slow onboarding process, so to speak. Well, today, I, you know, any, a lot of your system admins can just spin up a VM, and there's a new, a new server on your network, boom, like that. They could spin multiple up a day, uh, and they, uh, you know, everyone has a mobile device. They hook up to ActiveSync. They're getting their email. So the, the onboarding of new devices, new servers, new workstations is a lot faster than it used to be. Um, so how do you enable that to ensure that you know who's on your network, you know what devices are on your network, um, and you can manage them and enforce some policies on them that will protect you? So that's, an, that's one of the, the big challenges, just the, the rapidity of onboarding new users and new devices and servers. Some of the other challenges are, um, especially for the Unix folks, uh, that there's um, multiple ways to, to store the identities of who has access to Unix and Linux. You can store it locally on the machine. You can store it in another LDAP server. You could store the information in NIS. Most people have gotten away from that, but I still, believe it or not, see, you know, there are people out there using it. Um, and then uh, you, you could be using Active Directory in some shape or form, or, or maybe not at all. But, uh, so there's multiple ways to store these identities for the Unix and Linux platform. Um, as more people need access, uh, or you know, as you spin up more servers rapidly, uh, the, the, all the you know, inefficiencies around redundant data stores uh, become even more painful in terms of uh, provisioning users. So a lot of people are looking to centralize the management of their Unix identities. Um, another thing is establishing a global namespace. So uh, traditionally in the Unix Linux world, I could have one ID, I could you know, be LPOPIC on server one, and my UID, which really is what controls what I have access to, could be one, two, three, four. And then over on server two, it could be, you know, the first one was AIX, the next server may be HPUX, and I could be LPOPIC again, but underneath it all, my UID is six, seven, eight, nine. So there's a lot of disparate uh, identity information out there about Unix users. So that's another challenge when you look at centralizing identities, and then also managing them centrally and controlling what they can do on your platform. Oftentimes people have access uh, still to, to resources that maybe they don't need it anymore or I just lumped them in a group and gave them a bunch of access because that was the easiest thing to do. So how do you um, better control, you know, enforce least access? And all those regulations I asked you about, you know, the auditors get smarter every year um, and uh, they're questioning more, you know, who has access and, and why do they have it. 
right? Do they really need it? Um, and then enforcing, so managing privileges. So how can, how can you easily manage privileges? Um, I, I know some of the challenges in that area are for Unix and Linux. A lot of people have used uh, sudo. And sudo is a technology that's a flat file that maybe it's managed centrally and maybe you have a couple different versions of sudo but, and you push it out to, to the different systems. Or I've even been in organizations where there could be a different sudo file on every Unix Linux box you have. So it's not really a centralized store. It's more of a flat file kind of, um, um, if you coded in C back in the day, maybe everybody in here is too young. but. Um, you, you have these make files that you use to compile stuff. So sudo kind of, in a way, looks like these make files. You've got to know that language, too. It's another language you've got to know. Um, so th that's one way that they grant uh, privileges on the, the Unix Linux system. Uh, and then uh, for, for Windows, what we hear a lot from customers is, well, he, you know, this DBA needed access to this server and to do this, and I just gave them administrator because that was the easiest thing for me to do. I just made a local admin on that box. And so... Um, so the privileges out there are, are granted too broadly, and access, as I said, is granted too broadly as well. And then the last thing is, you know, how do I really know what these guys did with these privileges? And also, when I provisioned them in the first place, how did I do it? A lot of people are looking at, you know, provisioning systems, and then once they do that, they've got to look at, well, how many identity stores do I really want to provision? Because I got to keep all these guys in sync. Um, or, um, you know, I might be still doing manually provisioning to AD. So there's, there's challenges in all those areas that when you look at managing the privileged identities and enforcing least access and, and um, controlling your en environment, uh, those are challenges and, and they need to be considered as you, you come up with the solution. This just, uh, how many of you guys are, are looking at putting servers or infrastructure out in the cloud and how many of you are doing it? All right, so you see at the bottom, there's some of the challenges that you've got to think about and address, right? Um, a lot of people are holding off. Well, okay, so you know, we, could, we could have the philosophical debate about cloud's always been here if you outsource, right? <laughs> but um, a lot of people are holding off on using like Amazon.com or other, other types of uh, hosting services just because they don't know how they're gonna address these security issues too. Um, so. Just things to think about, challenges that are out there, and how do you manage it? And it all goes back to the challenges I showed on the previous slide. So Centrify's, um, Centrify's solution looks at protecting systems uh, in terms of enforcing consistent policy, um, authorizing privileges, uh, ensuring that people, when they, uh, that they're individually accountable for their actions. You don't use a shared account, you use your account. You may do things on behalf of root or administrator, but you're using your account when you're doing, uh, taking the action. And then at the end of the day, being able to easily report out, here's who has access to the box, here's what they can do, and in fact, I can play it back. So, let me skip. This just talks about uh, why did we choose? So Centrified leverages Active Directory to do this. Um, first of all, uh, pretty much everybody has AD. Um, Second, it's got this underlying technology called Kerberos. And Kerberos enables us to uh, not only authenticate the users, and it's a, it's a great form of authentication because it never sends the password across the wire. Um, and also, you can authenticate your system. So I'm not relying, if I spin up a server in the cloud, I'm not relying on a spoofable IP address. I also have this Kerberos credential or this cryptographic identity for my server. So that's another reason for choosing Active Directory. Um, and the resiliency that's already built in. So if the customer already has Active Directory, they already have um, you know, multiple domain controllers. And uh, the way that the Windows machines work, if one goes down, they'll find the next nearest one. All of our solutions do the same thing. So we take advantage of the resiliency built in to AD, as well as the extra security features with the Kerberos. And um, specific to Unix and Linux and Macs as well, uh, you can join those machines to AD using Centrify and then uh, use Kerberos for authentication and also group policy enforcement. This just touches on that. So the ability to centrally push out um, security policies to the workstations or servers. So a lot of uh, folks that contact us, uh, especially uh, you know, with the growth of Macs and mobile devices, they need to be able to um, ensure that uh, policies are, certain policies are on the machine. So they, 
for Max, just like your Windows workstation, I want a screensaver to come on after a certain amount of inactivity. And then after that comes on, I want to ensure that you have to have a password to get back in. Or if you're related to the government or uh, you know, some of the pharmaceutical companies, you also want to use smart cards. So how do you do all that? Well, um, it'd be great if you could leverage tools you're already using, like Active Directory users and computers and view policy. So that's why they call us up. Uh, instead of setting up a siloed solution where they have additional administrative interfaces. Same thing for mobile devices. We can set policies on mobile devices and you can join your mobile device to AD and it'll have an object in Active Directory as well. So uh, just you know, managing consistent policies on these machines using, um, using uh, tools you already own. This just touches on some of them. The last thing I'm gonna talk about here before I uh, go to the demo is um, on top of uh, the authorization and audit capabilities you're gonna see, we also have a capability to leverage, because we use Active Directory, um, and there's IPsec group policies in Active Directory, we have the opportunity to leverage those out to Unix and Linux machines. So, um, and this is unique to Centrify. Uh, we can enforce the IPsec policies on Unix and Linux. Um, we find that uh, a lot of customers never use the IPsec policies on Windows because, well, it won't work with my Unix and Linux, so I'm not gonna use them. Well, we enable that, and, and what they're good for in, uh, in, in getting a handle on your environment, especially if you're looking at the cloud, is that you can define encryption policies uh, dynamically and apply those on your machines uh, using, obviously, a tool you already know. But, um, and, and they can be used for isolating what machines can communicate with one another, um, or you can decide, I want to encrypt a, a protocol, uh, you know, be specific about a protocol, like FTP. I mean, you know, it'd be great if there was no FTP on the network, but at the end of the day, there are legacy applications out there that use it kind of a uh, use case. So you can use these IPsec policies for um, server and domain isolation as well as encryption of, of uh, different protocols. So I'm just gonna uh, take just a second here to switch over to a demo environment. Um, in my demo environment, I have a, I have a Windows uh, 2008 domain controller and a uh, couple of Linux instances and uh, this um, Windows machine you're looking at here that, that hosts just, app, uh, just um, administrative tools like Active Directory users and computers, the Centrify console, um, and, uh, uh, and also an audit database. We have one tool that, uh, we have a solution that'll allow you to play back user sessions and we store the, the user session data in a SQL Server database. But all the authentication and authorization and management of privileged users is, is done within AD and existing attributes. We don't extend schema, we don't require software and domain controllers. We're really uh, non-intrusive to the organization's Active Directory environment. So, I've got um, several, uh, Microsoft Management Console stacked here. So one is Active Directory Users and Computers. And um, uh, you, you know, if your organization use a, uses a, a provisioning tool, then uh, that tool would update AD with user identities as well as uh, um, their group membership. Or it, it could be manually done. And I'll, um, I'll just show a couple of users I'm gonna use for, um, for my demo. So I've got um, this user, Fred Thomas, here. And uh, Fred's gonna use his Active Directory identity to um, log into Unix, Linux, and Mac machines. And so you don't have to have any type of local account information about Fred on those operating systems. And if, uh, and all this account information um, will apply as well. And if, if I had specified a, you know, a home directory here on his, uh, his um, profile, that would apply as well. That, that's especially important for the Macs. Um, and here's his direct control information. And so this shows, here's his Unix profile attributes. And uh, just note that I have the ability to, um, to do an override on an attribute. So for those of you who are familiar with Unix Linux, this takes into consideration that use case where maybe I'm, I've got one set of identity information on one server and on a different machine I've got slightly different. Um, just know that we can map the same we can map the differing uh, 
Unix profile information back to the same Active Directory account. But um, more importantly, though, is here's the Active Directory groups he belongs to. So he's in this IT admins group, and you'll see later on that this gives him root privilege when he logs on to my Unix Linux servers. And it gives him access to actually all my Unix Linux servers because he's an admin and he needs access to everything. Um, he's also a member of the Mac admins group. This allows him when he logs on to a Mac machine to have um, uh, you know, local admin privileges. So I don't have to set that up on each box and I don't have to have him use a shared account. He's got it with his Active Directory identity when he logs on. And then um, mobile users allows him to enroll his mobile device. He gets access to the web servers via this other Active Directory group. But I think you get the picture. Based on an Active Directory group membership, he has a role in the organization of sysadmin, and then ultimately he gets data privileges when he logs on and access to certain, uh, certain machines. I have another user. Um, we'll use this one. Greg Adair. And Greg, um, he's a web admin. And his, his uh, Active Directory group member information is going to look a little different. So he joins the organization and either the provisioning tool or manually the security team adds his account to AD and they add him to this web admins group. And so you'll see in a minute he ha only has access to my web servers, nothing else. Um, and he has the privileges he needs to get his job done. So those are my two users. And then uh, here are the servers I'm going to use. Here's uh, my CentOS, CentOS 6 box. and. Uh, my four bots. This one happens to be a web server, and uh, this is just a regular old uh, Linux host um, in my environment. So that's how things are set up in AD. And uh, keep in mind, you know, that the ongoing administration of um, of this environment can be done through Active Directory users and computers, a tool you already own. So the, uh, a lot of our customers will offload this to the security team, or you know, or the the self-service provisioning tool, or what have you, and. And you know, based on management approval or security team actions, you'll be moved in and out of groups depending on what you need access to or what you need to do to get your job done. So um, let's just see what Fred's life is like first, and then we'll go back and show further details on how we set this up for Fred. So I'm logged on presently as, as Fred Thomas. So this means uh, you know, when I authenticated to Active Directory uh, earlier today, um, I had I had Kerberos available to me. So if I go to access another resource that's Kerberos aware or has Kerberos capabilities as well, I can just use a ticket and silently access that resource. So we can do that with SAP, with web applications. But right now I'm going to do it with the operating system because we're really talking about privileged users. So here's my CentOS 6 box. And I'm going to use Kerberos to authenticate. So notice it authenticated Fred um, with his Kerberos ticket. And uh, um, this AD info command just shows me that this machine is joined to AD. And it's, uh, it's in this preferred site. My domain is called ocean.net. It's in the, this preferred site, Ocean Demo. And that, that goes back to taking advantage of the resiliency built into AD. If one domain is lower down, I'm going to find the next nearest one. And then uh, the machine's uh, Kerberos credential is reset on 918, right? So that's its unique cryptographic identity. That's all tunable. You can set them as often as you want. I just this is what uh, my environment's doing. If I type ID, here's Fred's uh, Unix Linux info, or his Unix profile attributes. And if I hop over to another box, then I, I again use Kerberos. If I type ID, here's his Linux or Unix profile attributes there. For those of you that don't deal with Unix Linux, that's like no big deal, who cares? But for those of you that do, it's really cool that it'll map those differing identities back to the same Active Directory account. You don't have to get involved in that identity mapping. And that identity mapping can have an on your NetApp filer, your EMC Solera. Uh, I mean, it can be a challenge, right? And it ultimately becomes a different identity store. Uh, but with Centrify, we centralize all that in AD and we take care of it for you. All right, so let's get out of here and go back to uh, how did we set this up? for him to have access and also him to have privileges. So um, by the way, here's the group policy piece. And here's, uh, before I move on, just um, how we can. You know, we can set policies for 
different types of machines or like the, in this case, like a Mac workstations. We have tons of policies that are specific to the Mac, so you can configure them like you do the Windows machines. We could also do mobile devices as well. So that's just highlighting that it's there and there's tons of capabilities around um, in eventually enforcing policies on these machines, like you do with your Windows workstations, for those of you that are, are familiar with AB. So the next thing to show is um, how did we set up Fred to have access? And um, what kind of privileges does he have on the machines? And also the same for Greg. What's his, uh, what's his environment like? So here's my two machines. Um, and if I do a quick show effective users, this is going to show who has access to the box and what privileges they have. So you see this list of users here in terms of who has access, because now we've centralized all this information. And we see Fred, and here's his role assignments. Um, he's in the IT admin, sysadmin group. He gets a sysadmin role, and he gets this at the highest level in my organization. So he got access because he's a sysadmin, and I knew that based on his Active Directory group membership. If I look at Greg, the way he got access was slightly different. He got access because this machine is an Apache web server, and he's in the web admins group, and he gets the web admin role. So that, that's how these two differing people got access to my server. I also can see their rights. I can see, for example, Greg can only SSH to this box, and here's the commands he can run with elevated privileges. Right here is his whole list. Um, and if I took a look at Fred, his rights are slightly different. He can log in any way he wants, and he can run any command as root. So he's got different privileges. If I look at the uh, CentOS 4 box, you're going to see uh, fewer users. This isn't a web server, so we don't see Greg, right? He doesn't need access. It's not a web server. He doesn't have access. Fred, on the other hand, needs access to everything. There he is. So that just gives you a, a view to how we can grant uh, access. We can do it based on the role of the server. We can also do it um, based on uh, where the server sits in the hierarchy of, of, of my environment. So I have a um, what we call a, a child zone. So we use zones to delegate administration over who should look after the, the identity data and the privileges. And um, we use them for uh, um, controlling access as well. So here you'll see I have another user that, that wasn't available above. Um, and her name is Frances. And she got her role assignment here at a lower level. So she has access to this machine to do sysadmin work, but, but not on those previous machines I showed. So, okay, so that kind of shows how they get access. So how do they get their privileges? And today we do this for um, Unix Linux, but just in a few weeks we'll also have support for Windows as well. So you could use the same tool to control um, privileged users on Unix Linux and Windows. Um, and we control, as I showed with, uh, with, with Greg, we can control how they can log on or how they can access the box and then what they can do on the machine. So we have a way of defining rights um, in Unix, it's called PAM access. In uh, um, Windows, we call it login rights, how they can access the box. Um, here's all the different methods. And there's a standard on Unix, Linux called PAM, and anything that leverages that standard for authentication, we can control whether or not a user can use it. So there's applications out there like SAS that does the analytics uh, for companies and, and other things that, that use that standard as well. And then the commands for um, what they can do. And this is just a, a sample. Obviously, there's, there's a lot more commands in a, in a real uh, production environment. And then you assign these commands to roles. And um, uh, here's my web admin role, and those are the rights that Greg has. And here's my sysadmin role, again, the rights that uh, Fred has. And something to, to, to note about these role assignments. So they can be based on Active Directory group, like they are here. So I said any IT admin gets the sysadmin role. Or I can make a, uh, a temporary uh, assignment as well. So if I wanted to give, and I can do it on a server or a group of servers, however specific I needed to be. But if I wanted to give somebody a, a temporary role, I can do that and I can time box how long they have those privileges. So one of the big things about privileged identity management is what do I do if somebody needs to make a change on a production system, right? And But I don't want them to have access to that, to that on a regular basis. So. Um, that the, the process sometimes is called fire call, sometimes it's just temporary access, but um, how do I you know, grant somebody temporary privileges to do something on a server and then know that they've expired, they don't have them anymore? One of the big, uh, biggest findings uh, out there is 
why does this person still have access and you know why do they still have these privileges so this temporary capability um, uh, addresses that and finally you can you can tie the execution of uh, privilege commands like I'm gonna do here in a minute you could tie it to a change control system and they'd have to have a valid ticket to do that as well that's an optional component I only see that in the most controlled environments but um, it's out there for the taking so that just gives you an idea of how we set up um, authorization and the unique thing about uh, Centrify is we store all this data in Active Directory. So again, we're taking advantage of a repository you already own. Um, and you don't have to set up additional infrastructure because you've, you've got it. You've got AD, it's robust, resilient, and we store all the privileges in there. So let's go out as a uh, Fred one more time. And I'm gonna make a change here. So I'm logged in as Fred. I get a, for the Unix command line people, everything that I've showed you so far, you can do from the command line. Um, so I'm logged in as Fred and I'm gonna edit a file and make a change as root. Now I preface my commands with dd do just so people know they're using uh, our tool, but you can, you can use sudo, you can use the same syntax you're familiar with. All right, so I go in here and I'm just gonna make a quick change. You can pretend that I'm doing something awful to a web server or I'm leaving myself back door, but um, in my little world, I'm just gonna affect one user, it's Barney here. So, all right, so how do we know that Fred edited the Etsy password file? So, first of all, we know it because there's security logs on the system and they show me that Fred on behalf of user root here, edited the Etsy password file. So if, if he had used the root account, that would not be in the log. I would not know that Fred had done that, right? If he had checked out the user root account to do some work, that wouldn't be logged in the, the normal logging methods either, right? And, and a lot of people, they log to syslog and it rolls up to some other tool like Q1 or ArcSide or Splunk or what have you. So keep that in mind. Um, now, I know he was in there, but I don't know what he did, right? So depending on the type of server and the type of compliance reg you have to, uh, you know, you have to meet, um, there may be a situation where you need to know exactly what Fred did and what he saw and what kind of changes he made and how does that impact everything else. Well, um, I'm auditing this box. So in a minute, you'll see me play back Fred's session. Um, and uh, you can audit just for privileged users, privileged commands, you know, what have you. I'm auditing everything because it's a demo environment and I can. All right, one other thing to show, so that's Fred and, and running elevated privilege commands. One other thing to quickly show is uh, um, that user Greg Adair. Have you ever wanted, and, and I guess the question is, have you ever wanted to give someone, whoops, I should log in as Fred, give someone uh, just a white list of commands they can run and, and they can't do anything else. You could really lock them down. That's what we can do with uh, this web admin role. And depending on the type of system, that might be what you need. So this, this shows me, this command shows me quickly, um, here's what this user can do. And um, if I uh, try to just type a command to see what files are in the directory, it's not in my whitelist, so I can't run that command. But if I wanna restart the web server, no problem. I can restart that as root. So it's just another way of controlling privileged users is just giving them a whitelist of commands that they can run. Um, I, I go into a lot of places that say, I really, really, really plan on using that, that whitelist capability with my developers because I am so tired of being on call and they messed something up because we gave them more access than they needed in the first place so they could get their job done. So that's a good use case for that. All right, so we're almost done here, folks. So. Um, so, so that shows you how we can set up and control who has access to what and what they can do on the machines, and especially important for those privileged users. So how do we, um, wh what do we do when the auditors come and they wanna know, well, you know, uh, the typical questions, who has access and what can they do? So today you might have to touch each server or you may have to uh, um, you run a bunch of scripts and then massage some data in a spreadsheet uh, to, to figure out, you know, who's got access and what, what can they do. And, um, but with Centrify, once you centralize all this data in this repository of Active Directory, it's easy to show 
Here's who has access to each machine, and you can get multiple views on this. There's tons of reports here, but I'm going to show one that goes user by user and the machines that they have access to and then what they can do. So here we go. Um, so here's Fred, and you'll see he's got access to every machine in my demo environment, and he has root privilege on all of those. And then you'll see Greg, and you see he only has access to one box, only have one web server. And there's his privileges on that, machi that, that machine and how he can access it. So um, this is a big, big help to organizations that are audited and uh, um, um, it saves them a lot of time. So, so all this, again, is stored in AD. So these reports come from AD. This is, we haven't added any infrastructure here. Um, we just have the, the Centrify agents on the Unix, Linux, and Mac machines. And, um, uh, the, the console that you see there, which is an MMC snap-in and can be installed anywhere. Um, it doesn't, and it's, it's repository is Active Directory. So the next piece is a uh, direct audit, and this gets to, um, for example, PCI 10.2.2 that says you've got to be able to recreate what a privileged user has done on your, your machine. Um, Sarbanes-Oxley has some guidelines around that as well. Um, they have to know what a privileged user has done on your financial systems, and, and HIPAA wants to know what people have done around your, you know, your health data. So um, with direct audit, um, and we, we can audit Unix, Linux, and Windows sessions, we can play back what privileged users have done on the machines. So I could run a quick query on what's happened today in my environment, because I keep a lot of metadata about, um, about all my sessions. So here's what's happened today. It'll pull up any user session uh, with Unix Linux. And there's a Windows session right there as well. Um, and so we'll just play back Fred's session because I think uh, this really shows the difference between um, what you get, oh, that's the wrong one, <laughs> what you get with, uh, with just authorization and sudo tools and what you get with, with the ability to play back a session. So notice, um, I've got an index list of commands. If he typed a lot of commands, I could just jump to the one I care about. But we're going to play back his session really quickly. And we'll see him edit this file. And we're going to see exactly what he did inside the file. So here he goes. Previously, when I looked at the logs, and I, you know, maybe I got an alert, right, in my Q1 tool or arc site. Somebody added the Etsy password file. I didn't know what he did. I knew, I was able to determine from a log, he was the last one in, he went in his route, and he made a change. But with the audit tool, I know exactly what he did. It's like I was there with him. So other um, data we keep about these sessions that makes them easy to search for, for what's meaningful and to look for audit gaps is, is we can show you know, where the server came from, what's the IP address, the host name of the server, uh, what's the status of the session, when it started, when it ended. If it's still in progress, I'll know. It won't have an end time, and it'll have a status of, uh, in progress. And, um, you know, the user associated with it as well. And we have the ability just to, if you're a multinational corporation, some countries want the, the audit data in, in country borders. So we have the ability to have multiple audit stores and, and keep the audit data where it needs to be. Um, and then there's review status, and you can write comments on the sessions as well from a security perspective. So the last thing I want to show is, uh, let me find a good uh, Windows session here. Because we can also play back those uh, Windows sessions. And we keep a ton of metadata about them as well, so they're easily searched. And I'm going to start here where the user went into uh, Active Directory Users and Computers. Here we go. So it's just playing back a Windows session. Speed it up a little. And you'll see them go in and add a new user. They're going to put the user into some Active Directory groups, which gives the user uh, privileges on my box. Um, any type of audit event, like if you want to look after the SQL administrators, um, you have the ability to, to watch what the privileged users are doing um, on your Windows machines as well. So, um,
just in summary, uh, so you know, as our as our uh, compute environments get you know more cross cross platform, um, you know, for a while there, the I guess we could say the turn of the century. I thought Microsoft was going to take over the world, but they didn't. Um, they did put out a very good directory which we leveraged, but there's all kinds of other operating systems out there now to be concerned with. And organizations are looking to how do I streamline administration so that I don't have siloed tools for every different platform that's out there? Um, and how do I manage them and still control privileged users, control policy on my boxes, and be able to verify what these privileged users have done? So hopefully you've seen today a solution where um, you can uh, improve the security in an organization by the use of Active Directory and Kerberos, um, control who has access to what more tightly so you can enforce least access and least privilege, and then at the, uh, verify what they've done um, and ensure that they're individually accountable. They run commands as another user. They don't run it as that shared account. And I can, I can prove it to an auditor and I can quickly see um, what's occurred in my environment. We also have these tools for mobile devices, which uh, you know is, is for another day. But uh, if you're interested in that, you can uh, stop by our booth. Um, I'd be happy to take uh, you know a few questions um, if there's any out there. Anybody? Alrighty then, um, we can go for a break. Thank you very much. <laughs>